This is a Comics Alternative special, a conversation with Bob Andelman for Will Eisner Week. Hello, and welcome to this special episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek, one of the two guys with PhDs talking about comics. Will Eisner Week is March 1st through 7th, and for this year, I wanted to have a conversation with Bob Andelman. He is the official biographer of Will Eisner. The second edition of his book, Will Eisner, A Spirited Life, was released last year from Tomorrow's Publishing. And Bob and I have a great time discussing his book, Will Eisner, and his impact. But before we get to that conversation, I want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC... Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll see that those discounts are 20 to 35% off of the cover price, and every single month you're going to find some incredible specials. Sometimes those specials will be at 45% off cover price, sometimes at 50% off cover price, but often the discounts can get much more impressive than that. And for Will Eisner Week, you should go to DCBService.com and do a search for Will Eisner, and there you will find a slew of books by and about Will Eisner. In fact, you can get Bob Andelman's second edition of Will Eisner, A Spirited Life, for 25% off the cover price. You pay only $29.96, and you can get Will Eisner, A Spirited Life combo, which includes a DVD biography of uh, the life of Will Eisner. Also at 25% off the cover price for $37.46. You can't go wrong when it comes to Will Eisner and other comics creators at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your Will Eisner books there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. I've been wanting to have Bob on the podcast ever since his second edition of A Spirited Life was released in June of last year. And this year's Will Eisner Week provided the perfect opportunity. We have a great time talking about the genesis of this project, how Bob became the official biographer of Will Eisner. The many interviews he conducted in preparation for this book, including uh, new interviews for this second edition, working with his papers, interviewing a variety of creators who have worked for Will Eisner in the past. In fact, we cover a lot of territory. It's a great conversation, so let's get to it now. I'm pleased to have on the Comics Alternative, Bob Andelman. His book, Will Eisner, A Spirited Life, the second edition, came out last year from Tomorrow Publishing, and he is the perfect guest to have on for Will Eisner Week. So, Bob, welcome to the Comics Alternative, and happy Will Eisner Week. Ah, Thank you, Derek, and a happy, happy Will Eisner Week to you. It's specifically uh, significant that you're the one that we're talking to during Will Eisner Week because not only was Will Eisner, A Spirited Life, the first book specifically devoted to Will Eisner and his life, but yours is also the authorized biography. Uh, all true. All true. And you know, I, in fairness, I, I, would, I would point out that Cat Ironwood did a, a really great book with Will – probably 20 or 30 years earlier uh, when she uh, worked as sort of an assistant cleaning up his 
his uh, his uh, all of his uh, files and everything. And uh, you know that's a really seminal book, and it, I think it's out of print. But that was a great book, and I use that I use that uh, you know for research and reference. So in fairness, uh, it, I would say this may be the second <laughs> the second book. Uh, you know, this went places that that didn't, and I had the benefit of actually interviewing Cat about her time with Will. But thanks, I appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah. Now, um, we should mention that the first edition of the book came out in 2005, and the publisher was – it was M-Press, correct, uh, which is uh, imprint of Dark Horse? Correct. That's yes. right. Uh, but then uh, 10 years later, you came out with a second edition. So I'm curious what brought about the second edition, and what about the second edition is significantly different from the first? Well, that's a – Big question. So let me let me go a couple of places with the answer. Uh, the the enthusiasm at Dark Horse for uh, a Spirited Life uh, wilted after Will passed away before the book came out. It got delayed and delayed, and they just weren't as interested in it once Will was not alive. And so I always felt that it was somewhat underpublished. It was. A lot of people never knew it existed. It came out. At, it came out at the same time that uh, Will's uh, Will's final work, uh, the plot, came out. And while the plot got a lot of attention, the Spirited Life, the biography of the man, really didn't. Uh, it was just you know it was kind of underwhelming the response and the push from the publisher. So I had always hoped, and it's no disrespect. I appreciate you know that Mike Richardson and and uh, Diana Shu, uh, you know that they they championed the the project while Will was alive. But I had always felt that it could have been done uh, better, and uh, I had a ton of art that was available for the book that was not used. Uh, and I just I just always had this nagging feeling that it could be done better. Um, and so when the, uh, when the contract with Dark Horse uh, expired after five years, uh, I started nosing around, uh, not really aggressively, but eventually uh, I, I had uh, uh, John Morrow from Tomorrow's Publishing uh, on my podcast, Mr. Media, and after the show, we were just chatting, and I said, uh, I said, would you ever be interested in maybe bringing out a new edition of this? And he said, well, you know, I've always wanted to do an Eisner book. He said, uh, I don't know, is it? Possible, and we started talking. And he said he wanted to do it differently. <coughs> Excuse me. His idea was to do it as a as a big art book. Now the original was a a trade paperback, uh, and what he had in mind was to do what he does, which are these great art books uh, dedicated to individual artists and or themes. And uh, I was thrilled. Um, and so uh, we we went back in on on the text side of things uh there were some things there were some very minor things that needed to be corrected and then there were a couple big things that needed to be appended if you will um after the book the original book came out uh there were two people uh artists both artists uh, drew friedman and uh howard shaken who were not happy with the way they were portrayed in the book uh they felt that Will's stories about them were uh, inaccurate, incorrect, or worse. And uh, in Drew's case, he had declined the opportunity to be interviewed before the book was published. So he knew that one was on him. He could have cleared that up at the time. Uh, In Howard's case, uh, what I just took to be a a simple story, uh, he was very – after the book came out, in part to promote the book, I did a series of uh, interviews with uh, people who could either correct the record on Will or expand the record because you know you couldn't possibly get everything into the book. Mm-hmm. So the first one, the first one I did was with Drew Friedman, and uh, he, Drew had been a student of Will's at the School of Visual Arts, and the, the Will and one or two other students uh, remembered Drew a certain way, and it was not that favorable. And Will, Will insisted that, that Drew's uh, father, the uh, novelist and uh, playwright, uh, Bruce J. Friedman, had gotten a call from Will complaining about Drew's behavior. And Drew insisted it never happened. And he actually went and talked to his dad, and his dad said, I never spoke to that man. <laughs> um, and it was interesting because 
you know, Will, when I got him, was, oh my God, in his mid 80s. And, you know, all things considered, his, his memory was excellent. And there were very few things that anyone has questioned in, in terms of what he told me. And I spent two and a half, three years interviewing him and his family and his friends. There weren't a lot that was questionable, but. The business with Howard Chaikin and the business with Drew Friedman definitely needed the record corrected. So I, I went on to do, I think, about 18 of these interviews that were posted as blog entries at uh, aspiritedlife.com. And uh, so between that and some minor corrections, and then after Will passed, uh, you know, there were a lot of other things that, that happened. Uh, the plot came out, the uh, the crossover of the spirit and the escapist, uh, Michael Chabon's character, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Frank Miller uh, spirit movie, uh, the ghastly piece of dreck, oh, God. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that that came out. Uh, you know, there's been a whole. Um, uh, Will has become an even bigger, uh, bigger than life figure than he was uh, when he was alive. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, study of Will and his influence and. Uh, it just seemed like a good thing to to uh, update, and and then interestingly, so I had all this material on the the narrative side, on the text side, that I wanted to update and and expand, and uh, John Morrow and uh, designer uh, Eric uh, Noel Worthington, uh, they had some tremendous ideas about art. And, and some resources that I didn't have, and they they gathered phenomenal art, stuff that I hadn't seen, even though I had access to to, to Will's uh, archives at the uh, the Cartoon Art Museum uh, at Ohio State. Uh, and uh, between us, you know, I think there's a third more text than there was, and there's just a phenomenal amount of color and black and white art. Um, in the new edition that was not in the original. So long-winded long answer. I, I hope that, that got to the point, though. No, it, do, it does. And you know, I read the first edition of Will Eisner's Spirited Life. I guess it was not too long after it came out, maybe a year after it came out. It, so, so it's been a while. But you know, it is, as you mentioned, a trade paperback. So you do have uh, a smaller package, fewer images. You don't have the glossy... Uh, pages that you have with the Tomorrow's Book. And you're right in describing this second edition as something like an art or even maybe a coffee table book. I mean, it, it's really nice to have. So whether you are a student of Will Eisner's or you like to uh, you know, look at his work in, in nice larger edition texts, then this is definitely uh, you know, something for, for, for you. In, and I noticed that you have – well, okay, so you divide A Spirited Life into various sections uh, that you call four-color, opaque, gray, and then black and white. And then in this second edition, there's additional material in the legend section, which is where you discuss – you know this god awful movie <laughs> that, uh, that that Miller put out, uh, but also the Spirit series that DC brought back in mm -hmm. I guess the the mid two thousands. So there's an update there, but also it's these interviews, and I, and I want to talk to you about these interviews. Now you've mentioned the one with with Friedman, and especially. With with Chaikin, um, those aren't the only ones. I mean, for instance, there's the one with uh, Ken Quattro. One of the things I take mm. away from this second edition is the interviews, the additional material that you provide in this recent edition. In some ways, I don't know if it tempers our uh, our view <laughs> of Eisner. It definitely makes him more human. Uh, because on the one hand, one could see, it, let's say in the first edition, uh, a more positive uh, image of, of Eisner being presented, and especially coming out when it did, um, you know, you wouldn't expect anything less. But with, let's say, the the Ken Quattro interview and what he discovered in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, court testimony, uh, you know, Chaikin's take, and then there are other interviews as well that uh, you have creators who either question some of the things that Eisner did or don't have the most positive uh, view of him. They maybe feel slightly.
applauded uh, by him in the past. But what this does is it brings Eisner down on a human level and in many ways makes him much more approachable as a creative figure. I, I think that's true. I, and I will tell you that, I mean, there have been people connected to Will who were not happy that I, I up, updated the Ken, the uh, the Wonder Man story, which is what you're referring to with Ken Quattro right. mm-hmm. and the court case. Uh, but I just felt like well, – I mean, first of all, this was an authorized biography. Will authorized it. I have a lovely letter from him authorizing it. And he – you know, he did read the manuscript uh, probably six months before he passed away. Um, not, and he didn't have any rights to change it based on his feelings being hurt. He had he had the right to point out to me if I got something wrong factually. Uh, and and there was you know there were one or two things that I left in the book that he was not thrilled about. But factually speaking, uh, like things things about him being cheap. Uh, other types of things, <laughs> you know, that I had documented over and over again. So, so many people had referred to it. Um, so, you know, he wasn't thrilled with everything in there. But uh, after the book came out, and, you know, I heard from Friedman and I heard from uh, Chaikin, and then reading Ken Quattro's Comics Detective uh, breakdown on what actually happened in the Wonder Man court case. Uh, it, it, you know, you can't ignore that stuff. I, I, and, and you know, part of it is, I mean, I'm a lifelong journalist. I've been, you know, a reporter and a, and a writer uh, for, forever. And while I was a comics fan first, I, you know, I, I don't have a problem with with treating you know comics creators like people who are fallible. I know there's a lot of people in the comics press who don't see it that way, uh, which is you know, which is okay. But I just thought, how can I, how can I responsibly Write, uh, you know, the man's biography uh, without, you know, clearing, setting the record straight. Um, and so there you go. Uh, and yeah, I, there have been a couple people co- connected to uh, the Eisner estate. Let's just say who were not thrilled with the Quattro stuff. The other stuff, I, I think they were fine with, but uh, they would have rather I'd left that out. <laughs> Yeah, again, what that does for me is it humanizes uh, the guy and makes me even more interested in the complexities of his character that comes out in his art. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I mean, you know, uh, these artists are not perfect. Salvador Dali, who, who I think Will is in that, that class uh, for what he – for his field – you know, I mean, not a perfect man. Not uh, you know, uh, both very driven by commerce, for example. Uh, you know, and would sometimes say things to get attention, which is fine. I mean, you know, it's, you're you're the product of the era you grew up in, and uh, that's it. It's when I think when you start glossing over people's lives and leaving out, you know, things that uh, you know make them less the, than a perfect figure. That you know, I think you, I don't think you do anyone. Uh, justice. I mean, I, I'm not writing a textbook for for the Texas Board of Education. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, okay, let, let's let's talk a bit about your relationship with Will Eisner. You know, this is uh, an authorized biography. Uh, mm-hmm. um, what was your relationship with Will? How did you meet him? Um, what kind of back and forth did you guys have while he was still alive? As opposed to um, while he was dead and you used meetings. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I go and I worship at his gravesite pretty much once a year. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, in the big picture, uh, I think Will and I had an extraordinary relationship. Uh, and I, no one stepped forward to, to, to argue that. I don't, th- I don't know if anyone could. We spent so many hours uh, together or on the phone. Uh, I stayed at his home with him and his wife Anne a couple of times. I stayed nearby. I spent time with his brother. He gave me his Rolodex and said, "Call anyone you want," uh, which I think comes through. And you, you know, you read through the book and you see all the interviews and all the people who contributed their thoughts. Um, I, I got the gig uh, at a point where, to be honest, I was not that. I, I didn't know that much about Will. It was this would be about two thousand and two. Um, I, when I was a teen uh, in the 70s, uh, I, I bought the Spirit uh, magazines that uh, Jim Warren put out as they were coming out. I didn't know anything about the Spirit at the time. I thought they were fun. I enjoyed them. Uh, they didn't change my life, but they were fun, and I, I bought them all. I had them all. Uh, and actually, I met uh, uh, 
Will's old partner, uh, Jerry uh, Iger, uh, decades before I met Will. Uh, I, I met uh, Jerry Iger at uh, comic book shows, probably a Creation Comic Con or cr- whatever they were called at the time uh, in, in New York, probably at the Statler Hilton uh, when I was a teen. And I had a, a comic book fan club called the Fans of Central Jersey that I and two other guys, uh, Bob Penaha and uh, Chris Petavano, had founded. And, uh, you know, we always went to the conventions and somehow i met this uh little older guy and and we were talking and you know he he was telling me that he was a comics artist and i didn't know him from adam you know and he he gave me a uh uh a picture of his character bobby oddly enough my name is bob <laughs> uh and of course his great nephew was named bob uh, bob Iger, who now runs disney and marvel and uh, but you know it wasn't significant at the time, and I, I actually I corresponded with him. Uh, I don't remember why, but I corresponded with him a couple of times via old-fashioned letter writing. So I'd actually met Jerry Iger decades before I met Will. So anyway, fast forward to 2002. Um, I'm uh, I make my living basically writing or co-authoring books with people. Uh, my agent uh, uh, in 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 New York uh, knew. Uh, Will's literary agent, uh, Judy – oh, gosh. I swear to God, I, I can't I, – I'm trying to think of Judy's last name. Anyway, she was Dennis Kitchen's partner uh, with their literary agency, and um, they knew each other, and they knew that um, uh, Will – they wanted Will to do his memoir, and they thought it might be a good match. So uh, Dennis Kitchen – who represented Will on the art side and had been his friend for uh, 30 years at that point, uh, did a, a long telephone interview with me and decided, yes, this guy is okay. He should go down and meet Will. And so um, beginning of February uh, 2002, almost 14 years, a little over 14 years now, um, I, I, I took my wife and, and child and we went down uh, to meet uh, Will and uh, had lunch. And uh, I, I I like to say that my child kind of won won him over. Uh, I don't think he could <laughs> care less about me, but uh, my kid was pretty ch- pretty damn charming. And they come uh, in we, handy every now and again. Every once in a while. I mean, you know, they're kind of expensive to raise and feed <laughs> and clothe, but every once in a while. Uh, and so um, he hired me ostensibly to be his ghostwriter uh, on on a uh, autobiography. And as we got into it. And I started getting the first uh, or second draft of the proposal done. Uh, he called me up one day. I remember because I was on the road in Orlando, and he called me on my phone and he said, um, "Listen, I don't think we're go- I don't think I can do this with you." He says, "It's just it's just too much work, and um, I just uh, you know I, if if I do that, I'm not going to have time to actually do m- my books." And at the time, I think he was working on. Uh, Oh, gosh, my memory is so bad now. Uh, the book before the plot. Uh, was uh, it the name of the game? Fagin no, the Jew? Fag- it was Fagin the Jew. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's good to, it's good to be dealing with a comic scholar. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was Fagin the Jew. And you know, he just was – I said, well, OK. I said, think about this. I said, what if we do it as a biography and you just cooperate with me? I'll do all the work. I'll be responsible. I said, but I'll be the one to get paid. <laughs> he said, fine. If you don't mind doing that, that would be great. And so that was when he wrote me the letter uh, officially saying that you know it was an authorized biography. And uh, we uh, – the first year – and I had no intention of this being a three-year project. I was thinking it would be more like a six-month project. The first year we met in person, uh, I don't know, every month maybe, uh, every other month, something like that. And we carved out phone time once or twice a week. We do like an hour uh, uh, once or twice a week. So it didn't really cut into his uh, his drawing time. And uh, we just uh, – we really hit it off. I, I felt like we had a, a great personal relationship. And it's hard you know, when you have somebody come into your life who is there to – study your life and to talk to you about every aspect of it it's you're either going to have some chemistry or you're not and and i i maintain that we had very good chemistry and i had good chemistry with his wife ann as well uh because we spent so much time together and we had a lot of laughs and uh you know he talked to me about things like uh 
the death of his daughter and, 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 and the situation with his son that he hadn't talked to anybody about, including his wife. In, in decades. I mean, there were people who didn't know he had children until that, that the first edition of the book came out. He had never discussed it. He had he had, had friends for 30 years who had no idea that he and Anne had children because the things that they had been through. So, uh, I don't know. Did I get away from your question or did no, I answer? No, no. You, 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 you were spot on. But now I, I want to ask you, you mentioned um, him talking to you about his daughter. And again, it's been a long time since I read the first edition of A Spirited Life. And I can't remember. Did you mention in that book the connection between the death of his daughter and um, a contract with God, that very first story? Yeah, that that's in the book. That's the okay. first place it's ever been discussed or okay. was ever published uh, that uh, a contract with God was inspired by the death of his daughter. His daughter, for those who don't know, died of uh, leukemia. Uh, she was – this is about – I want to say about 65, 66, maybe 67. She was a teenager, 15, 16 years old. And uh, she was the youngest of his two children. He has a he has a son who's a, little, a couple years older, and uh, she got sick. Uh, they didn't they couldn't di- they didn't diagnose it for a while, and then she just died a miserable, terrible death. They, it was something that you know they they can they can do a lot to treat leukemia now. They can actually get you into remission, but in the '60s, that just wasn't. It, it, they didn't know how to do it, they, and he was so he and he and Anne were just so torn apart by this. It just seemed so unfair, and he very often, you know, found himself saying to God, "Why, you know, why would you do this? How could you do this to me? Didn't we have a contract? Didn't we? I was supposed to take care of my wife and 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 children, and and you would, you know, you would take care of us and." Uh, it just, you know, and and it was, you know, a full a decade later that. Um, he he did a contract, but it was never discussed at the time. And a part of that, of course, is you know you didn't have this twenty four hour uh, press and internet and all those kinds of things. So uh, you know, no one really pressed him to find out that it was a personal connection. It wasn't just a it wasn't just a an invented uh, you know piece of piece of piece of story for him. It was real life. Yeah, but it also strikes me that even if we did have the same kind of media, social and otherwise, at the time, he still probably would not have been the kind of person to reveal that kind of autobiographical connection with Historia Contract with God, because at least from the from the portrait that you paint in the book, uh, things like that he he kept inside. Well, yeah, but the difference is that now we have uh, you know we have access to the birth records of everyone who's ever lived in the United States. <laughs> And you could you could find out if you were curious. You could do a, a freedom of information search, or you know you 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 could figure it out if you wanted to. If you wanted to find out more about Will, you could do you know a search, and you could find that he had children, and you might put two and two together. Yeah. Um, now, uh, at the time of your first edition, uh, I guess there was was there any hint whatsoever that something may have been a uh, tad amiss with uh, with the let's say the Wonder Man story and his court testimony, or is this something that for you as his biographer came completely out of the blue a number of years later? Oh, completely out of the blue because he had been telling the same story that he told me. He told it to Cat Ironwood. He told you know he told it to other people, uh, and 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 he got away with it uh, because. And I don't want to give all the details because I want people to go and read the the, the, the story. But uh, you know, the, he had given one version of of the trial over you know the the copyright infringement of Wonder Man, the character that he. Drew and created versus Superman, and it was all within the you know that I guess it was 1940, 39, 40, um, and so uh, no, he'd been telling the same story for so many years. I suspect will believe the story at that point. I mean, you know, I interviewed him about that in what 2003, so 70 years, <laughs> you know, 70 years had gone by, 60 years, let's say 60 years had gone by um, since the court case. And I mean, even for a guy who had a phenomenal memory of details and facts and people, uh, you know, if you tell the same, uh, you, you tell the same story over and over again, it becomes fact. Uh, that's, you know, the, uh, so. And most of the other people 
pretty much none of the other people who were involved in the court case were, were still alive. And there were no – apparently there were people over the years who had tried to find the court records and the transcripts and they just seemed to have vanished. Uh, and you know it's interesting to find that they actually had you know complete transcripts from that era, but you know with the government documents and storage, who knows where they were? Ken Quattro still won't reveal where he got them. Um, he's not entirely sure of his source, but they were you know he 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 confirmed that they were the the real thing. Uh, I had no idea. I was blown away, uh, and the only I think the only reason I found it was that. Um, uh, he had uh, – I, I, well, I do a – I have a Google search for Will Eisner or A Spirited Life. So you know, any day that there's something new on Will or, 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 the, or, the, or the biography, you know, I get a little Google email. Great, mm-hmm. great thing, by the way, folks. If you don't have that for things that you're interested in, it's, the, it's one of the greatest things of living in the modern era. But um, so I saw you know, The Comics Detective or whatever it said and something about Wonder Man court case, and I pulled it up. And my jaw was on the floor. I mean, I read the whole damn thing online, and I just could not believe. And and that was, you know, for me, if there was nothing else that made me believe that I had to get a new edition of the book out, it was that. Yeah. And and when did uh, when did you read that article? <sighs> wow, would have been about t- 2012, 2013. Wow. I'm trying. I I I don't remember the exact date of the of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, and then I called Ken and and chatted with him, and he agreed to do an interview, and and uh, and and it was there were a couple interviews, like there was the interview with him, and there was an interview with Sergio Aragones, who that I had held out, I did not publish online, I had held those out as they were going to be unique uh, to the book if I ever got a new edition out. Uh, so you know, it, it took a while. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now you're someone who, uh, as you pointed out, before you met Will Eisner, you were aware of him, some of his works, but you know, you you weren't uh, an enthusiastic uh, fan of his. You didn't know as much about his life. I mean, once you got immersed in the life of Will Eisner, it, 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 did you find that there was a particular part of his biography that fascinated you most? Uh, it, it, it seems to me that we can roughly divide his career, and, and correct me if I'm wrong or if you see this in a different way, into kind of three stages. You know, There's the early stuff that takes us up to and maybe including uh, 1952 when the spirit wound down. Uh, and then from that point until we get to the early 70s, his work at more maybe more as a businessman uh, you know, with PS Magazine, with American Visuals. And then in the early to mid-1970s when he becomes aware of uh, the American underground comic scene and starts working on a contract with God and then devotes himself to you know what most people call now graphic novels, um, it, it seems to me that that's a, a rough breakdown of, of his career. Uh, do, do you see it that way? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, I think that's a very uh, accurate way of, of breaking it up and, and examining it because uh, yeah, I mean in fifty fifty one fifty two when the spirit wound down and he you know he never that spirit never grew beyond twenty newspapers at most and he had to find some some other way to earn a living and you know he kind of anticipated the uh, the attack on comics and you know he could see the writing on the wall that he was not going to be making a living that way. Uh, and then uh, you know he got that second second breath. Uh, I, I mean, you could you could say that uh, in the '60s uh, w- when uh, Jules Pfeiffer's uh, the great comic book, uh, the great what was it? Great comic book heroes, great comic book. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it was it great comic book heroes? I think that's what it was. Yeah. Uh, and you know, everybody knew all of the characters in there except this little. Uh, detective in the lower corner of, of the cover with the, the little mask over his eyes and uh, you know that kind of brought him back to, to uh, familiarity and, and it reintroduced him to a whole generation like myself um, and that created the opportunity to go on and do uh, you know all the great uh, graphic novel work that he did so yeah I think that's uh, you could easily break him into three uh, three periods sure and did you find a particular period of his career that fascinated you most? Um, yeah, I mean, I I think the the spirit years, the original spirit years, are just amazing because they're funny, 
Uh, you know, he never wanted to do a, a superhero, or as they called him then, a costume character. Uh, you know, he just wanted to do little uh, O. Henry type stories using the medium of, of comics. And you know, he was kind of backed into the corner because the superheroes were so big, and that's what that's what the syndicate wanted. But he did it his own way, and you know, no one had done it like that before. You know, he told his little detective stories. Uh, the spirit was just a man who got beaten up, unlike in the movie, and you know, things. He, you know, he he'd get beaten up, he bruised, he bled. Uh, but you know, there was always a little story. Sometimes the spirit was barely in the story. Sometimes he was just the narrator of the story. Those are so well written and so well crafted and so well drawn. Uh, you know, the graphic novels. I mean, Contract with God is brilliant. Uh, Fagin is brilliant. Uh, Name of the Game, The Dreamer, which is basically you know uh, autobiography for the most part, and then uh, the plot, which is which takes the uh, takes his uh, his craft to a whole new level in terms of social uh, commentary. Uh, you know, that's very good. But on the whole. I mean, you give me uh, uh, one of these spirit uh, collected editions that DC did, and I could sit down with that, you know, you know, for hours. It's just so uh, incredible. The color, the, the the dialogue, the cleverness of it, the funniness. Uh, um, I love when I when I give, uh, you know, over the years I've given a lot of talks on Will at libraries and at comic book shows and bookstores. I love to my, – my favorite example of how clever this was is uh, when he did uh, a takeoff on uh, the Cecil B. DeMille film, uh, Samson and Delilah. Oh, yeah. And uh, can I tell you the story? Oh, of course. So That's why we have you on the podcast. OK. All right. Well, I don't want to push my luck. So he, um, he had just met this girl, uh, Anne – what was Anne's last name? Well, Anne. Let's go with Anne. And he had met her, and uh, she kind of called him out for up for a date. And she had just started a job at Paramount Pictures in in Manhattan, working in the publicity department, I think. And so for their first date, she invited him to go to the world premiere in in, in New York of Samson and Delilah. This new. Uh, Cecil B. DeMille film, this multi-million dollar film, just a very expensive, very, you know, huge spectacle type of thing. And, you know, not having the benefit of the internet then, very few people knew what a bomb it was going to be. Only the people at Paramount knew how awful this film was. So they go, and nobody knows Will, nobody knows Anne. She's been, only been on the job a short time. And Will watches this film, and he thinks it's the funniest thing. So he goes home, and he immediately decides that the next – uh, the next spirit, the Sunday spirit, the seven pages, is going to be a, a parody of Samson and Delilah uh, called – I think it was Sammy and Delilah, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it comes out on like the following Sunday, just the, the at the end of the weekend that the movie has opened, and it just rips the movie apart. It, 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 folks, if you haven't read this particular – if you read no other spirit comic from the – from from the early 1950s, read this one because it's so funny. It's 1949, 1950, I think. Um, and he just rips rips the movie apart. He rips Cecil B DeMille apart, but it's all done in parody style. It's like a it's a precursor to what Mad Magazine did, uh, you know, with movie parodies in the early days, and and continues to do. It was so funny, and every line is funny, and every picture and every image is funny. Um, so anyway. Uh, Monday morning, Anne goes to work, and all that this, she's hearing about at the office is, "We're going to get that Eisner, that son of a, you know, we're going to go after him, we're going to sue him." And so Anne goes off somewhere quiet, and she calls Will on the phone. And now you've got to remember, they've been on one date; they barely know each other. And she's so concerned about him that he's going to get sued, and he's in all sorts of trouble. And she calls him up, and she says, "Oh my God, it's terrible! What's the matter? What's the matter?" And he's thinking, "What did somebody get hit by a truck, or what's you know?" So she says, "Oh my God, they're so upset about about your about your your comic." And really, you know. And Will's like, "Hmm." So he's like, "Okay, well, uh, thank you so much for telling me. I'll I'll take care of this. Are you sure you're going to be? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be fine." So he gets off the phone and he calls his uh, his editor at the uh, Des Moines Register. Uh, uh, syndicate, uh, Busy Arnold, and says, Busy, you're not going to believe this. Paramount Pictures is going to come after us and sue us for the parody of Samson and Delilah. And they're like rubbing their hands together with glee. Oh my God, we're going to get attention for the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> it was
was just ha- the happiest thing that happened to him. So uh, I don't I don't know that anyone at Paramount ever made the connection that Anne had taken Will to the grand you know the uh, the grand premiere the the big the big opening. Um, but you know it was just a great story, and to me. I mean, there's a lot of great spirit stories. There, you know, there's the ones before he went off to war when he was really involved every day. There's the the brief run of the daily uh, spirit strip where, uh, you know, like he did five days of nothing but f- uh, four days of footsteps in the snow. That's all you had for four days, and on the fifth day, you see the spirit face dead, face down in the snow. No words, no story for the whole week. I mean, stuff like that is incredible. But for me, the Samson and Delilah kind of captured the whole thing. <laughs> Now, in your interactions with him, um, uh, was there a work or a portion of Eisner's work that he tended to feel more fondly about than others? So, for instance, did he feel um, more of a connection or more warmth or have better memories for his spirit work than he did his later graphic novels? Or, I mean, did, did he seem to favor, let's say, one child over the other, in other words? Interesting. Um, that's a good question. No one's asked me that before, and I, I'm hesitating a little to answer it. I want to think. Um, I mean, he he was very very proud of the graphic the graphic novels because he you know as as people know he he felt that he had brought uh, adult uh, values to a kids medium, and he was you know he treated he he felt that you know you could do anything in in comics that you could. In, in in any other medium, um, but I, you know the spirit always, the spirit was his baby. The spirit was was you know what made him a wealthy man. It 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 was the gift that kept giving over the years because he kept it. He kept the comics in in print. They were constantly being you know sold overseas in different languages. They were always coming out in different editions. Uh, you know he he uh, he got. Uh, uh, movie option money year after year after year, even when they didn't produce anything. So that was the gift that kept giving. <coughs> but I think, you know, I think he was extraordinarily proud of the the graphic novels uh, that he did. I, I know that he was very appreciative of uh, uh, the Dennis Kitchen always pushed him uh, to do more and do better. Um, and you know there was the there was the Will Eisner Quarterly that Kitchen Sink Press put out for a while, where it actually you know he would do like uh, chunks of stories that would eventually be collected in in the books that we're more familiar with now. Um, and you know I, I think that yeah I, okay you know as I'm talking my way through it I'm thinking that that period uh, from from Contract with God all the way through the plot it probably is the work that he is probably most proud of. Hmm. And, you know, one of the reasons why I ask that is when it comes to the the graphic novels, everything from Contract with God uh, to the to the last work, the plot, um, the the major works there are still in print. Uh, you know, several years ago, Norton had the rights to republish a lot of that stuff. You know, the Contract with God trilogy, his autobiographical stuff, and his New York narratives. With a spirit, though, it, it, it's a whole other bag because you know there was you, you've referenced the DC Comics and those wonderful archives that they put out for a while. A, again, I think largely thanks to, to Paul Levitz. Uh, mm-hmm. Now we don't have those anymore. Actually, we do have the very last volume of that that um, Dark Horse put out, and they just put out a new printing of that. But that's not. I mean, that's the spirit, but it's not Eisner spirit. Um, so. You know, it's it's been really spotty. DC's been really spotty in keeping that stuff in print. In fact, last year, if you remember, they came out with this really nice seventy uh, five seventy fifth anniversary edition of Spirit, and you have a variety of stories from the entire run of the Spirit. They include a lot of good stuff. Sometimes they don't include things that I think that they probably should have. And we even inter- reviewed that on, on on the Comics Alternative. But before that, really, a collection of Spirit stories had been out of print for a number of years. Because my, my colleague on the podcast, Andy Kunka, and I had mentioned several times before that book's publication that if we wanted to teach the Spirit in the classroom – 
our hands were tied because mm. our, we could not get student, we could not get an edition, a collection of spirit stories for students to read for class because they were all out of print. And, mm. and so I, I think that it's odd that a comic that put him on the map has been out of print, it seems, almost more times than not in the modern era. Well, the fact that it put him on the map doesn't mean that it was profitable for publishers. I'm, you know, in 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 all honesty, my my understanding. Now, I'm not. I had access to a lot of Will's uh, uh, files. Matter of fact, in, in his studio in Florida, he would basically just say, "Okay, there's all my file cabinets. There's all my files. Go through whatever you want. Have access to whatever you want." I don't know exact uh, figures for sales. I think that he made. He made his money from licensing more than from royalties. You know, he he was always licensing the character and 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 such. I don't I don't know that there's any publishers out there that will tell you that they made a lot of money being the publisher of the Spirit, which is probably why um, you know it has bounced around over the years. Even now, I mean, DC is not the publisher of it. They're, or DC is a publisher co-publisher with what uh, Dynamite, I think. Um, uh, you know, I've kind of lost track of well, that. Well, I know Dynamite's it, it, doing that new series. Right, okay. but but and you know DC had held the rights for a long time and and they did some some different things, uh, but I don't know that it's ever been profitable. It's a prestige thing, you know, within the comics industry to be the per, to be the the publisher of Will Eisner and the Spirit. Uh, Mike Richardson had said to me years ago that well he want he he bought the rights to my book the biography because he wanted to be the publisher of everything Will Eisner that DC didn't have. Uh, you know that was always, that's why he published Last Day in Vietnam, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm I'm not surprised to hear that it was sort of out of print and out of reach. That's um, yeah, interesting. I, I was always sorry. I, I loved uh, Darwin Cook's uh, original run when they brought the spirit back the first time. Uh, I thought those were great. I, I enjoyed uh, Sergei Aragonis's work with uh, Mark. Uh, Evanier, mm-hmm. and and uh, I, I and I think I'm in a very small minority of this. I loved this st- the stuff that DC attempted to do with their first wave, where they created a universe where Batman and the Spirit and Doc Savage and uh, the Avenger uh, all lived in the same little world and had adventures together. You knew it couldn't last because. It really didn't make any sense, but I loved it. I mean, I absolutely loved it. Um, what, what do you think of? Uh, and this is from a couple of years ago. That crossover that IDW did with the Rocketeer and the Spirit. Well, <laughs> it was it was cute. It was that's a you good know, word it, for it. Yeah, it was cute. I, and I'm a big. Uh, I love the Rocketeer. Anytime I see the Rocketeer on TV. Uh, I stop whatever I'm doing and sit down and watch it from whatever point I pick up in the movie. I just – I love the character. Uh, I love the film. Uh, it was a little too cartoonish for both characters. I mean I I think both characters are funny. They have a good sense of humor. Uh, but that was done just a little too much on the childish side, I thought. Okay. Is that – is that a safe answer? <laughs> That's a safe answer. Okay, now you mentioned movies. Let's let's talk about uh, Frank Miller's The Spirit, uh, <laughs> because you know this came out after your first edition. You confronted it, so to speak. I won't say engaged with it. You confronted it uh, in this uh, latest edition. So, I mean, what were your thoughts and disappointments? Because everybody seems to have nothing but disappointments with this film. Well, uh, I will tell you I'll right let off you the top count the ways. Okay, well, no, I mean, here's the thing. I'm going to tell you. I still have not watched the film. Oh, really? I, I refuse to watch the film. It, it, I mean, it was so un- – and that's why, like, in the book, in the new edition of the book, I have uh, someone from Ain't It Cool News who gave me permission to publish their review of the film because I didn't want to have to watch it. Um, and uh, I, I didn't. I mean, there was it was so uniformly uh, – I mean, you can't find anyone who will say anything nice about that film. I own it. I have it here on my shelf, um, but I, I haven't watched it, and I don't have any intention of watching it. I mean, you know, it's kind of like the, the the new version of the Fantastic Four movie. That's two hours of my life I'll never get back. 
you know, I mean, the only good thing that one can say about that the 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 latest Fantastic Four version, strangely, was uh, Michael. Um, oh gosh, um, the guy who played the Human Torch. I thought he was incredible, and he was the he was the he was the one thing I was expecting to hate the most, and I thought he was the best thing about that movie. Well. In the spirit movie, I mean, the girls are gorgeous, you know, the, the women are gorgeous, but, you know, I've seen clips and Samuel L. Jackson, that's, I mean, that's just ridiculous. This, uh, uh, you know, it was a great career move for, for the guy who plays the spirit who went on to star in Suits and, uh, you know, he, he, he plays a character named Harvey Specter, get it? Specter, spirit. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, they've. There have been a couple of times where they've made uh, – they've dropped in spirit references on suits. For example, in one episode, he's in the library of his law firm, and on a on a bookshelf behind him, you can see uh, copies of the spirit DVD right over his shoulder. Um, but I, I'm, I'm being honest with you. I'm not going to – you don't need me to attack this movie because it's been done so much more articulately and so ma- so, so often by so many other people. Uh, and I, I, I don't present in the book. Uh, I think I'm pretty clear. I never say in the book. I never give any impression that I watched it. I report on it like a reporter. Yeah. And, and I have other people talk about, uh, like Sergio Aragonis, uh, you know, was 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 brilliant in his comments about uh, Frank Miller and the movie. I didn't really think that. If if I felt the need, I would have sat down and watched the movie and given my. But you know, the book was. This book is not me critiquing Will's art. Uh, it's me telling the story of his life. Right, uh, right. If you want a critique of his art, then you want to probably pick up Paul Levitz's new book on Will, which does a pretty good idea, pretty good, pretty good job of that, and puts it in perspective. Uh, which you know, I, I never, I, I even say in the introduction to Spirited Life that that's not what I'm setting out to do. I'm not trying to be a, a, an art critic. I'm trying to tell you the story of a man's life, who uh, the story of a guy who, for seventy plus years. Was in the business and led one of the most amazing uh, lives and had the most amazing career that anyone ever will. You know, this is interesting. You're talking about what your book does and what Levitt's book does. You know, here here is a figure, uh, Will Eisner. You know, one of the leading creators in American comics. Um, we have a couple or three biographies of him that's been published. Yours is the authorized. We have, as you point out, Paul Levitz's emphasis on his art. You know, and, and that's a beautiful edition. It, it came out last year from Abrams. Uh, if uh, people haven't picked it up, they should definitely do so. Yeah, he did a nice. He did a really nice job on that book. You know, but when it comes to a critical engagement with Will Eisner's body of work, you know, from the spirit all the way to uh, the plot, there's really nothing in, in terms of a a longer critical study that we have. And, and I find that, if not interesting, then, then curious and a, and a bit disturbing. Now, you know, <laughs> as a comic scholar, you would think that, of course, there is a critical book on Eisner's work. There is not. Um, in fact, there are not that many scholarly articles published on Will Eisner's work in comic studies, which... I think is is a dirty shame. When when I published a couple of articles a few years ago, looking at um, one was on a contract with God, and I looked at that as kind of a comics equivalent of a short story cycle. And then I also published a work on uh, Dropsy Avenue, looking at it uh, as a text that deals with uh, ethnicity in America, and not just Jewish ethnicity, but ethnicity mm-hmm. as, as a whole, and the, this whole idea of a cycle, because it's also part of a cycle. You know, the uh, the Contract with God trilogy, um, and you know, in doing the research, I found that there's almost nothing out there uh, when it comes to criticism, scholarly criticism on Eisner's work, which I find strange. Why do you think that is? Well, let me ask you this. Uh, I mean, is there that much scholarly criticism of other artists? Oh, definitely. Out there? I mean, serious. I mean, serious scholar. Yes. I, I mean, I don't know. This is not. This is not my field. But I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, I mean, I know there's lots of books and collections of Jack Kirby's work or Neil Adams' work. Uh, you know, I mean, the person I'd be most fascinated with, frankly, would be Steranko's work. I, I think it's. 
it's astonishing, you know, what he the body of, of comics art that he created. But I mean, is there that much scholarly criticism? And I mean scholarly. I don't mean fanboys blubbering over art because that doesn't really advance. The oh, exactly. <laughs> no, I no, I'm talking about scholarly criticism, and uh, both in terms of booklet studies and also articles that appear in, let's say, edited book collections as well as in peer-reviewed journals. There's relatively little out there on Eisner. You'll find that, well, I mean, with someone like an Art Spiegelman, there is uh, tons. In fact, one can make the argument that, and, and I have before, that there's almost too much. Uh, he becomes and, – and I love Spiegelman's work, but I call him one of the usual suspects because he's someone – he's like the go-to guy. If someone is interested in, let's say, literary studies and they do anything with comics, they immediately think of Art Spiegelman because of Mouse, because everybody knows Mouse. Uh, mm-hmm. And there are a few other creators who are like that as well. You know, um, We have uh, Marjane Satrapi. Uh, there is Alison Bechdel. There is Chris Ware. I mean, these people have, you know, quite but, but, a number of, of scholarly works out there on them. Even someone like uh, a Grant Morrison has much more criticism out there, scholarly criticism, devoted to his work than Will Eisner. Well, but okay, but a lot of the people you were mentioning are people who do, you know, graphic novel type work as opposed to being, uh, you know, better known for. A, a, a comics character like the spirit i mean i don't know and also you know the, the bigger issue is somebody you you're going to take on a project like that if someone's willing to pay you to do it in most cases you know and a lot of this comics uh, criticism uh, to to my impression uh, there's no there's no there's no there's no money to be earned in it there, no it's, it's not, not going to me there is not, not. <laughs> yeah i mean it's not going to sell a lot of copies uh you know, uh, even the Eisner book. I mean, I, I wish that I could tell you that it sold tens of thousands of copies, but the interest is not that is not that high. I mean, it's just not that high. That's true. People who are interested in comics, they want to read comics. They're yeah. they're not as uh, you know they're not as committed to uh, you know to. To, to the medium as a high level of art. Okay, see, you, okay, you mentioned just a second ago that many of the people that I pointed out are known for their graphic novel work, not you know individual comic book series. Um, well, you could say that Will Eisner and his place in American comics now is primarily weighted toward his graphic novel work and not so much the spirit. And so I would think that you know the creator of A Contract with God, with Dropsy Avenue, with A Life Force, with The Dreamer, with The Name of the Game, uh, with A Family Matter, with Minor Miracles, uh, with Fagin the Jew, that he should have much more scholarly work on him out there than he does. But that's not the case. Well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't argue that. I would say that um – uh, you know, when uh, Norton brought out the collections of his work, they were treating him uh, as a major American artist, that they collected his work. And they probably went into it thinking, you know, someone will want to do a big scholarly, uh, you know, takeout on, on Will's work. And yet, uh, I don't know, are those books still in print even? I, yeah, I don't uh, know the the Norton. Oh yeah, yeah, they're still okay. in print. All right, good, good. But I have a feeling that they're not they're not making a ton of money, and as such, the, Norton is probably not likely to want to you know put down uh, several you know tens of thousands of dollars on someone who's going to take six months or a year or two years to write a scholarly the ultimate scholarly work uh, on Will's art. You know, histories have been done. We've, I think we've, we've extinguished the need to do another Will Eisner history. Um, but you know, if there's if there's no money in it, uh, you know, if you're the kind of person who's going to write that thing, if if there's more money in a Spiegelman book or a Steranko book, then you're gonna you're gonna go that way. You you know, you, your heart may be in 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 the place for Eisner. I mean, maybe maybe Derek Royal should write that book. Well, I can tell you that uh, <laughs> the thought has crossed my mind, and and here would be a potential stumbling block. We were talking about Norton, and I can tell you from personal experience. In fact, do you have to eat? Very recent personal experience. <laughs> That when you contact Norton to ask for permission to reproduce even just a couple of images from his books that they have the rights to, um, 
it is not a pleasant experience. Now, those of us in academia who publish on comics, you know, we have to deal with this all the time. And I think when it comes to non-mainstream stuff, but but you know, even even with DC and Marvel, I think sometimes it's easier to get permission, and sometimes for absolutely free, because if it's a scholarly work, you know, they'll think, you know, well, who's going to read it, right? Um, yeah. But um, I, I've just been amazed at what Norton requests, at least initially, when you want to reproduce just one or two images. And so I'm wondering if for some that might be a potential turnoff because I have to tell you, um, I have thought about the possibility of doing a critical work for the University of Press of Mississippi's um, – I think it's called a comic – they have a few series when it comes to comic studies and one is uh, a series devoted to, to major creators. Um, you know they have books on Cur- they have a book on Kirby they have a book on Morrison um, uh, 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 Tezuka they have one on him but not Will Eisner and mm. it would be fascinating to do a critical study of Eisner for the University Press of Mississippi I don't know though if it would be doable in using the number of images that I would want to use and trying to negotiate with the Eisner estate and uh, Norton. Now, I think the the Eisner state would be uh, more approachable on this because what is it, Carl and Nancy? Um, uh-huh. You know, they've always been friendly with me in my interactions with them. Um, but I think I'm wondering if that is uh, like the cost of reproducing or getting permission may be a little off putting to some scholars because we don't make money off of the articles that we publish in journals or in other people's uh, edited collections of books. Well, I, I would say this to you or anyone who's thinking about it. I would I would approach the estate rather than Norton uh, to do something like that. I, I imagine the estate, uh, which really works hard on the educational aspect of of Will's work and f- furthering his work and you know comics, uh, you know, as a, an educational tool. Uh, I would I would approach the estate with a project. Before I would talk to Norton and let the estate deal with Norton. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, I learned that the hard way. Right now, I'm in the process of finalizing a collection of essays that I'm editing on Jewish comics, and there, in that collection, there are two essays on Will Eisner's work. And I write one, and uh, another scholar friend of mine writes another, and both of us are using two images each from Eisner's work, and it's his graphic novels, not the Spirit. And mm. initially, I contacted Norton. About about permission to use these, and that was a headache. And then after a while, I decided to just go to Carl, and he stepped in and was an intermediary and really handled things nicely. So uh, I, you know, I, I thanked him at the time. I want to thank him now on this podcast <laughs> for for doing that. But yeah, that that is good advice. Well, uh, I, I have to say, I've been doing you know with with the estate now for ten years. Uh, Carl and, and Nancy uh, Grapple, uh, Grapper are uh, they're wonderful people. They're quite devoted. Uh, to uh, continuing Will's work and his influence, uh, you know they're acting on uh, Will's Will's wife Anne is still with us, and uh, they are acting on her behalf, and and they're, you know they do a wonderful job. They're great people, um, and you know they they have a vested interest in in seeing Will's er, Will's work continue to proliferate so you know for you or anyone else thinking about an eisner project i would reach out to the eisner estate before i would talk to norton uh, let them let them do the hard work because if they support the project they'll they'll make the rest of it happen okay now let me ask you we were talking about some of his graphic novels as you were doing research for a spirited life as you were immersing yourself in his work um is there a particular book that – okay, two-sided question. Was there one of these – and I'm not talking about the spirit. I'm talking about the, the graphic novels. Was there one that you consider your absolute favorite or at least a contender for your favorite in one that for you uh, just kind of fell flat? <laughs> uh, okay, so you want me to pick my favorite uh, Eisner graphic novel and my least favorite? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm more interested in the least favorite because you know, I, I, I'm just curious what you would consider uh, the least successful. Uh, wow. Um, let me let me uh, hold on a minute. Fortunately, in a spirited life, we we have uh, one of the one of the the, the the few things that I had to do for the estate. Uh, 
to get this done was we published an, an entire list of all of Will's uh, books. So give me a second. I will look at this uh, <laughs> And I will tell you. I think I think I know which one I'm going to say. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, for me. Uh, yeah, this is the one I thought I was thinking of. Uh, Life on another planet just did not do it for me. I just, I you know, not too excited about it one way or the other. Um, uh, I thought uh, the flip side of that is. Uh, the name of the game I thought was uh, was was an uh, extraordinary uh, story. Uh, the Dreamer is just kind of fun, and uh, and Dropsy Avenue is really good. And Dropsy Avenue is interesting because um, it has been I think it's been per- I don't have sales figures on this, but I, I think it's been it, it captured the attention of a lot of people outside of the United States. I mean, in in Brazil huh. they mount they mounted an entire uh, uh, play, you know the at the at the level of like their Broadway, uh, based on Dropsy Avenue. So, and the Brazilians have loved Will's work. They probably they probably have a greater appreciation than than Americans or Europeans for Will's work. I don't know exactly what it is. I, I never quite understood, you know, wh- why it clicks so well there. But uh, having interviewed uh, several several Brazilians uh, for the book and talked to people over the years, uh, there's no doubt that that the, those folks just really had a special appreciation uh, for That's interesting. You know, if I had to pick some of my favorites of his his graphic novels, it would probably be something like To the Heart of the Storm or Dropsy Avenue. And the thing about those two books that draws me is the way that they're structured. Uh, I mean, I think that they're great stories, phenomenal art, of course, but the way that he arranges the story and to me, it seems like those books are perfect meldings of the narrative itself and what he's able to do with the comics medium. Uh, it, I think those books stand head and shoulders above even even something like, let's say, the Contract with God uh, collection. Um, the one that – or books of his that – I don't know if I want to say they fall flat with me or annoy me at times. It's it's when he tends to slip into sentimentality, mm. uh, and uh, and I see this with uh, let's say the building. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people like the dreamer, but there's something about the dreamer. I mean, I love the autobiographical side of it, but there's something about it that seems just a little too sweet. Um, and I don't mean necessarily in a saccharine way, but 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 maybe so. Um, and even Fag and the Jew, as much as I like that book, it ends on, I think, a, a sentimental note, mm-hmm. and that doesn't really resonate with me. I mean, I like the darker, more naturalistic side of Eisner, which I definitely see in Dropsy Avenue and even in, let's say, A Life Force and To the Heart of the Storm. So, I, you know, for me, I guess it's maybe a, a matter of, you know, what are your tastes and what kind of Eisner do you like? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's. I think that's quite reasonable. And you know, when you when it's someone who's produced so much material that I think everyone's going to have a, a, a somewhat different view. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, when you when you were working with him, um, and you know, you met him while he was working on Fag and the Jew. You mentioned that earlier. Um, what did you talk with him about in terms of Fagan? Because in many ways, you can read Fag and the Jew. As his response or his acknowledged awareness of his, if you want to put it this way, problems with Ebony White in the spirit stories. Wow, I think you're. I think you're at a. You're venturing into a pay grade that's above me. <laughs> because, and he, he even mentions this. Oh God, it's been a long time since I've read Fagan, but I think maybe in an afterward where he says that. Um, um, he he realized later in his career that the way that he visually represented Ebony was not as flattering as it could have been. In other words, he was playing into certain stereotypes. Sure. And because he, he talks about the stereotype of the Jew um, in his afterward of Fagin the Jew. And, and, and I mean, I, I'm not suggesting that he was writing Fagin the Jew as a way of – you know, kind of making amends for his treatment, uh, visual treatment of Ebony, but 
I, I don't know. So I guess I'm wondering if, if he talked with you about that in any way, about his feelings of the spirit and the way that he wrote the character Ebony White regarding well, race. Well, I mean in terms of Ebony, I, you know, at the time he was doing it, that was – unfortunately, that was a perfectly acceptable uh, way to, to present a, a, a black caricature. Uh, and um, you know, there was one particular artist who when Will was in the army – who, who went too far, made the lips really big, made the butt really big, and exaggerated even beyond what Will did. And, you know, he, he tried to get that tamped down. It was Lou... Um, Lou Fine? Lou Fine, thank yeah. you. I'm, I'm, what can I say? I'm, I'm old. <laughs> I've been talking about Will now for 10 or 12 years, and I, I, some things just slipped by me. Um, uh, you know, Will's feeling, I, I think, was that, uh, you know... His the, the way he presented Ebony at the beginning was it was just acceptable at the time. I don't think he, I, I don't think like a lot of people do until they realize that they're offending someone. They just they're like, oh well, that's just the way it is. And then you find out that your portrayal uh, of someone is is offensive, and I think you back off. I don't think he's ever I don't, not ever like he could now, but I don't think he ever really like out and out apologized for Ebony. I think one of the things he would always point out was. Ebony always tended to be smarter than the spirit, uh, despite the way he was drawn, which of course was very much caricature and stereotype. Um, you know, Ebony always was one up on the spirit in terms of knowing what's going on. Uh, he suddenly, you know, sometimes he was the one who would solve the case or figure things out, and you know that I think that seemed to be more the case uh, even later in the series uh, when Will returned to it after the war. Um, but yeah, I don't know that I could uh, respond, respond to the. Uh, connection you make between the spirit and and Fagin. I, I mean, the biggest thing with Fagin is Fagin, and then on to uh, the plot. Uh, I, and, and you know, Will was really feeling his uh, Jewish roots uh, late in his career. He was never a, he was, and we talk about this in the book. He was never a terribly religious man in terms of you know uh, going to temple and and doing prayers. But he 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 had a very spiritual side to him. And you know he was very uh, late in his life. He was very, uh, very concerned about you know the Holocaust deniers and things like that. And uh, you know, so I think that's where a lot of the Jewish portrayal comes from. But uh, I can't really make the connection that you're asking. But I'm not saying that you're yeah. wrong. I, but I, I can't say that you're right either. I just don't know. Yeah. Now you mentioned the plot. Do you consider the plot his most Jewish book? Wow. Because uh, there are a number of contenders for that. Yeah, I mean, Contract with God is probably as much uh, to, you know, if you want to talk about Jewish as religion, as as spiritual, mm-hmm. I think the plot talks more to the, um, the, the, the attitudes towards Judaism over the years and how, you know, there, there was an, an active conspiracy to, you know, make Jews – uh, targets and and blame all sorts of things on them that you know was never historically accurate and I think the plot digs very deep um, and and that was Will and Be- uh, Benjamin Hertzberg Berger, uh, who, who who whose work you know really did he, Hertz, Hertzberger did the the research on that uh, I think that goes to the history of Jews and uh, I think that uh, probably uh, contract goes to the spirituality. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I could, I, 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 you know, when we have the, the you know, fr- fr- Frimmy, the, you know, raising his hands to the sky and say, "We had a contract." I mean, I, you know, that's, yeah, it's not hard to picture uh, older Jewish men being like that. Yeah. Uh, that that you know. Uh, and the thing I love about a contract with God is that the of the four stories. Um, the very first one, which is the title story, A Contract with God, is overtly Jewish in a spiritual way or religious way. And then the very last one, Kukulain, is very Jewish but in a cultural way. And so they provide – I think those are really nice bookends because the two stories yeah. in the middle, you could say, well, yeah, there's certain Jewish aspects to them. But I, but I think that the ethnicity in those two stories, and that's what the street singer and uh, the super um, – uh, the, uh, the ethnicity is tapped down quite a bit. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah. Well, I mean, he he never. I mean, he was Jewish, but he didn't. 
he he didn't beat people over the heads with you know his uh, his his religion or you know how he was brought up because he was not a practicing Jew. Mm-hmm. So you know he was just trying to capture something. I think. Yeah, I mean maybe he was he was Jewish like in a way that let's say Saul Bellow was Jewish in his work. Right. Uh, I think maybe a good way of, of putting that. Uh, you know, you mentioned early on in our conversation, Bob, that uh, one of the ways that you came to this project, Will Eisner's Spirited Life, is through you know your your journalism and your larger body of work. And, and I want to ask you a bit about your role as Mr. Media, because that's <laughs> how I first got to know you, even before I knew about your work on, on Will Eisner. So uh, it, it, could you... Uh, describe to our listeners who Mr. Media is. Never heard of him. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I uh, in the about 1994, I started doing a, a weekly newspaper column called Mr. Media, and it was uh, a collection of I would find uh, um, great quotes in magazines or on TV or movies. Uh, the things were said, and I would collect them, and or there'd be a great article that I'd want people to read. Or at that time, it was the beginning of the internet, and maybe I would find a website and I would present a URL when it was more a string of letters and numbers that didn't make any sense. Uh, the, the, that was originally that was eventually syndicated by Universal Press Syndicate. With they, for people don't know who that is, it's uh, they distribute Doonesbury all over the world, for example, uh, and Ann Landers or Dear Abby, that kind of thing. Um, and so uh, I continued it till 1998, stopped it, brought it back in 2007 as a podcast, just kind of playing around. I had a digital audio recorder, and since then, it's I'm, I'm in, I'm actually in my tenth year uh, now of doing it as a podcast, uh, and it is uh, interviews with uh, uh, TV stars, uh, film. Film stars, uh, directors, writers, novelists, uh, politicians, uh, athletes, anyone who f- I find interesting and, and I think is going to be uh, make good conversation. Uh, and a lot of comic book people have been in there uh, uh, over the years. Uh, and in the, last, in the last six or seven years, we've switched from being an audio podcast to being video. So uh, there have been things like uh, – you know, we take advantage of the video as much as possible. Like when I have a, a cartoonist on, whether it be a daily uh, a daily cartoonist for the newspapers or a comic book person, I'll ask them to do a little demonstration of their work, so you can actually see, you know, how they do uh, what they do. Um, uh, one of the, the I think the first one of those was Mark Schultz, who's uh, Cadillacs and uh, dinosaurs, uh, or Xenozoic tales i guess it was also known as um it's actually showing you how we would draw stuff and it was just like wow you know this is pretty cool so uh, that's the essence of what mr media is yeah, and people can check that out at uh, what is it mrmedia.com yeah mrmedia.com yeah. Uh, you can see it uh, and it's all over the place anywhere anywhere you can find podcasts you can find it it's uh, there's a youtube channel it's on iTunes. It's on uh, the Stitcher uh, mobile app, uh, uh, Blueberry, uh, I don't know, Vimeo, Daily Motion. Pretty much anywhere you can find a podcast, you can find Mr. Media. Um, I don't know if you remember, but when you were first Mr. Media, that's how we made our first contact between the two of us. Is that right? Um, when I was in graduate school, and this is um, you know mid late nineties. Uh, I maintained a website called the Gallery of the Absurd, and actually, I still have it. Oh my it. god! It's, yeah, it's I a do. Blog. And once, That's right. once it started to get a little bit of attention, and I was just a lowly graduate student learning to to work uh, a little HTML language uh, as a way of you know keeping from writing my dissertation. Um, it started to get a little <laughs> attention, and every now and again, I would get these emails with little icons that I could put on my website to say, you know, you have won the such and such award, or such and such thinks that you have a cool website. And I remember getting one from Mr. Media. <laughs> and I probably have that graphic that somewhere like in my uh, past uh, archival files. Yeah, we reached a point. That's right. I do remember doing that. We reached a point where we we had a little, uh, you know, sight of the day or some kind of thing from Mr. Media. Uh, uh, yeah, and I, I do remember. I do remember mentioning that. And, and I think you may have reminded me of that before. And now I'm just going, oh yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah it was fun. And and the reason it didn't uh, take off in the '90s was that uh, newspaper editors, newspapers were notoriously slow in a, in, a, in adopting 
the internet and using it and and being part of it, uh, they would see uh, in these uh, uh, columns that would go out from Universal Press, there'd be like a quote and then there'd be a, a URL, and they would be like, "What is that? That I, we're not going to print that." So they would, you know, they would they would print the the quote, but not the source because they didn't understand what a URL was. Uh, and you know, it, it, uh, finally, I just threw up my hands and said, "Oh." <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> and then later brought it back as a podcast. Yeah, and and that was uh, that was kind of an accident too. I, I have a a friend. His name is Kit Boss, who is a, uh, a TV writer and uh, a showrunner. Uh, currently, I believe he's the showrunner on iZombie, and oh, wow. he's yeah he's been a writer and producer and showrunner on. Uh, things like uh, King of the Hill for many years and, and Simpsons. Uh, I knew him when he was a newspaper intern uh, many, many years ago when he was just a kid out of college. Anyway, uh, he hired me at one point. He had a show called Creature Comforts. It lasted four weeks in the summer on CBS. It was a, it was a, a an American edition of a very popular British uh, show done by Ardman, which is uh, you know Wallace and Gromit and things like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he, th- what they did was man in the street type uh, recording where you would go and interview someone about a subject, and then they would they would take the audio and they would do um, Wallace and Gromit type uh, clay claymation uh, of animals saying the words <laughs> that real people did. Anyway, uh, so to do the recording, I needed a uh, digital audio recorder. So I had spent a couple hundred dollars on this. And thinking that you know this show was going to run forever because it was so popular in Britain, uh, and then you know it didn't, and then I had this device, and I I thought, well, what can I do with this? And um, I thought, well, I hated the word podcast, I still do, and I hated the word blog, and I really didn't want to be associated with it, but it just seemed to be where the way it was going, and I thought it might be fun. So, you know, like the first interview I did was uh, Mark Tatuli, who does the Leo L I O uh, daily comic strip. And uh, he uh, he led me to Stefan Pastis, who does uh, Pearls Before Swine, and I had uh, 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 David uh, – oh, gosh, the, cr- the creator of The Wire. He was on one of the early ones. Uh, uh, Raquel Welch was on. And it was just you – know, it, just, it just became fun, and I, I loved – you know, I love doing interviews. So when I have downtime, basically between uh, book projects or magazine work, I, 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 you know, I'll stack up the interviews. So, and in fact, in in um, one of the signatures of uh, your email that you've sent me, there is a quote from Raquel Welch. And and how does it go again? <laughs> I'd rather. St- Hi, this is Raquel. Yes, that Raquel. And I'd rather stick needles in my ears and listen to one more minute of Mr. Media. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have a better one today. Actually, just before you and I started, I did an interview with Mr. Skin from MrSkin.com, and he recorded a promo that hasn't been heard yet. But it basically says, "Hey, this is Mr. Skin, and when I'm not watching nude nude film clips, I love watching Mr. Media." <laughs> so I, I know. hey, you're 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 a backseat to to Skin Flicks, but at least that's something. <laughs> I thought that was – I told him. I said, OK, that's better than Raquel Welch. That was just so funny and it came out – it so came out of left field because most people can't think on their feet like that. and They'll just say, hi, this is so-and-so and you're watching Mr. Media. But you know, <laughs> I can't wait to share that one. Mm. Oh, so this is uh, on this recording. that It's kind of like breaking news. It is breaking news. Yeah. It is. Um, yep. <laughs> well, you know, I would be remiss as we're wrapping up our conversation uh, for Will Eisner Week if if I didn't ask you um, if did you get uh, or were you part of the Kickstarter for the lost work of Will Eisner that uh, Locust Moon Press is putting out? I did. Um I didn't know anything about it uh, before they launched the Kickstarter, and I generally avoid Kickstarter campaigns, certainly as Mr. Media, because there's just so many of them, and you know who knows if they're going to pan out. But I, I knew about the uh, – and I didn't know about the book project, but I, I knew about the uh, plates uh, that had been found probably 10 years ago, mm-hmm. and the, I had been approached actually then – by the guy who had found the, the plates uh, about, well, what, what do you think I can do with these? And Is I this think Joseph that I, Getziger? 
Yeah, I think that I had put him – or I don't know if it was refer- – I think I may have been contacted by the reporter who first covered it who tracked me down and said, what do you think you should do with this? And I, I think that I put him in contact with Carl Gropper and or Dennis Kitchen uh, at the time. And so I knew it existed and it kind of – it was out there for years before this came along. Uh, but yeah, I did. I mean, I I put in. I I took a flyer on it. I felt like it would be bad juju for me not to, uh, you know, uh, invest in it. I'm I'm very I'm delighted that they had so much success. Uh, I have a feeling they're going to sell more copies of that than I did of uh, Spirited Life. It seems like it was very popular. Uh, the plates. Uh, it was an amazing find. Uh, the only better find would be if somebody uh, were able to find all of the um, the the original uh, plates or pages. From PS Magazine for that 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 sat in um, Army uh, warehouses for years, and then someone decided that they they needed the storage space, and they allegedly burned or threw them all out. Um, no yeah, one's ever gotten bottom of that. You write about that in the book. That's sad. Yeah, Cat Ironwood went all the way down to where they were supposedly held, only to find out that they had just recently been tossed out or burned or something. And uh, they've never they've never surfaced anywhere. So if somebody has them, they've done a good job of of being silent about it. And so I think Cat assumed, and I assumed, and Will assumed that they were really gone, that they're not coming back. Mm. But that would be a phenomenal uh, a catch because I mean partly because it's Will's work, but there were so many other great artists that had worked in the studio over the years, uh, including Mike Plug and others, uh, whose work is in there. Uh, so you know all those originals. Uh, it was just it's just a real crying shame that they do not exist. Apparently. Mm. Well, Bob, do you have anything else lined up for Will Eisner Week, uh, or are you gonna just you know lay low, kick back, <laughs> and pick up a copy of one of his books and reread that? Uh, I might do that. I, I, I you know t- all this conversation we've had about the spirit. I I'd really like to go reach over to the shelf and maybe pull out one of the. Uh, I have the I have the entire set. Uh, Will actually gave me. You know, it's interesting. Will would get uh, all the publishers sent him everything, so he would get. You know, every 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 time one of those uh, uh, collected editions of the Spirit came out, they'd send DC would send him at least one box of them, and so he had this this whole room that was just copies of his work. So he gave me the entire set. Wow, which was a phenomenal gift. And you know, I mean, I know that my set came from Will. My kid knows that we have the set from Will. Uh, I think the fir- I think he. I think he signed the first book in the set. Had I didn't ask him to sign all of them, that would be ridiculous. Mm. But uh, yeah, I think I think it's probably this would be a good week to pull that out and you know and really enjoy his work again after you know a long time. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Well, Bob, I want to thank you for being on the podcast and uh, talking about not only stuff regarding Will Eisner Week, but specifically uh, the the second edition of your book, Will Eisner, A Spirited Life, uh, which came out last year from Tomorrow's Publishing. I think that's a great work, and uh, I hope that it continues to sell. Thank you, Derek. I I really appreciate that. I appreciate your support of the book and of Will's work, and uh, thanks for having me on the show. I enjoyed it. So there you have it, my conversation with Bob Andelman. I want to thank Bob again for taking the time and talking with me on the podcast. I had a great time. And if you want to check out his book, Will Eisner, A Spirited Life, then go to the website of our sponsor. That's Discount Comic Book Service. If you go to dcbservice.com, you'll find the second edition of the Will Eisner biography at 25% off of the cover price. In fact, you can also find a variety of other books by and related to Will Eisner. For example, The Last Day in Vietnam, Fagan the Jew, Last Year's The Spirit, A Celebration of 75 Years, and, believe it or not, a few volumes of the DC Comics Spirit Archive Collection. So it's a great place to get caught up on all things Will Eisner, dcbservice.com. 
And after you do get your books by and about Will Eisner, get in touch with me and let me know what you think about the conversation with Bob. If you go to the website, comicsalternative.com, you'll see that you can leave us a voice message through the wonders of SpeakPipe. It's very simple and easy to use. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way. The phone number is 415-3-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. You can also email us. We're two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can email me directly. I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can also find us in a variety of places in the social media sphere, including Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn. And as always, you can find every single one of our podcast episodes as well as the reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog. And that's at the website, comicsalternative.com. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your Will Eisner week. And keep your ears open for more podcasting fun from the Comics Alternative.